Well, hello everybody, this is Dale, and we're looking at the last lesson of the book of Joshua, lesson number seven. A quick review. To this point in time, we've seen in Joshua chapters one through five, that Israel crossed into the land. Chapter 6 through 12, Israel took the land. They had the two kings of the east, which happened under Moses, given to two and a half tribes, and 31 kings of the west. Joshua gave nine and a half tribes this uh, inheritance. Chapters 13 through 21, which we saw last week, last couple of weeks, the land was distributed uh, by the inheritance and for the inheritance. And so we get to ch the last uh, few chapters here, 22, 23, and 24. A couple of interesting things going on. Uh, one particular thing that we're very familiar with a verse, but we don't know the context of it. And sometimes the context will really give even more insight as to what was being said in a particular verse. In Joshua uh, 22, uh, the warriors from Reuben, Gad, and half of Manasseh returned to their possession on the east side. So they were headed back. They had done everything that they had promised to do. On the way, they stopped and built a large altar on the west side of the Jordan River. And they did this as a witness that God was on their side. They did this as a witness uh, for generations yet to come. And, and the scripture tells us that when you read it closely, it said that we're doing this to where our children and our children's children and children, when days to come, when we're on the east side of the river, that they will not forget, but also those on the west side will not be able to say, oh, you're not a part of us because you're not in the real promised land. Okay, some interesting things related to that. And so they built this altar as a witness. Well, the folks in the West found out about it, and they were immediately incensed. You did some cross-referencing as to why they would have been upset. And the reason they would have been upset is, God told them in Deuteronomy, He said, if, if any of y'all become worthless men and you go off to a city and you start worshiping pagan gods and building altars to other gods and neglecting the Most High God, then you are to go deal with your brother and you're, go to, you're to go and kill your brother. Okay? You're to go to do them in. And so they thought this is what was going on, but uh, they had the wisdom to do something. The tribes of the West, they mounted up and they took off to go down there to see what was going on. And they got there and they asked to see what it was. Well, the tribes on the east side said, wait a minute, wait a minute, we built this thing as a witness between us, between us that we are one, that we're not that we're not worshiping another God, we're not doing anything. And so those who are on the west side uh, said, oh, okay, that's cool, that's fine, we understand, that's all right. Then you say, well, that's an interesting story, what does that have to do with us? Very vivid picture of how we're to deal with sin. And you did some study in 1 Corinthians 5, and you could have also gone to Matthew 18 and some other places. We are to deal with sin in the body. If someone is sinning, if a brother is sinning, we are to go to them and say, Hey man, you know, you need to quit this. What's going on? Can I help you? If they refuse to listen to you, then you're to take somebody with you and say, You need to repent from this. You need not be doing this type of activity. If they refuse to listen to you, you take it before the church. Don't worry, that's hardly the great thing in the background. You take it before the church. And then you remain aloof and you treat them as a tax collector or something like that. And it doesn't mean that you're rude to them, but you let them know that as long as you're in this type of thing, then you're manifesting evidence and fruit of the flesh that you're really not a true believer. Now, if you do things this way, God will work and God will restore people. And so they were going to come along and they were simply going to do what the word of God says. And that's the picture for us today that we need to do this. In Joshua 23... And you find some things out. We've mentioned before, the Lord is saying, hey, I'm the one that fought for Israel all these years. I'm the one who drove out your enemy from out of the land. Joshua reminds the people that he's at the end of his life, and he reminds them of some stuff. And he does this in, in chapter 23 and 24. He tells them, you need to keep to the commandments of the Lord God written in the law of Moses. Don't associate with the nations. Cling to the nation. Uh, cling to the Lord and love him. They were not supposed to associate with the nations anyway. They were supposed to utterly destroy them. Remember that phrase? To utterly destroy them. He's, but then Joshua, and these are intriguing passages, because what you would find is that he would come along and be saying something to them, and he would be speaking forth the truth, and then he would move into a prophetic mode. And I hate to even say it that way. But he would start saying things to them, saying, here's what's going to happen. He said, if you don't do this, then this will occur. And then he would start speaking in a way of like it has already occurred or that it is really, really going to occur. And if you're not careful, you'll start thinking, well, there's nothing they could have done about it. Oh, there's plenty they could have done about it. They could have walked in obedience. Okay, They could have been faithful to what the Lord had called them to do, and it wouldn't have happened. He told me, he says, if you intermarry among the nations, it's going to be a snare and it's going to be a trap. And that's exactly what happened. One of the cross-references you had was in 2 Corinthians. 
We found out uh, that we're not to have any type of partnership or any fellowship or harmony agreement with anybody uh, that is an unbeliever. Now, a lot of times we'll, we'll acknowledge that in a, in a marriage relationship to not be unequally yoked, is the way to describe it, be not unequally yoked. That, that goes with business things and stuff like that. That doesn't mean that we live lives of isolation. It doesn't mean that at all. What it does mean is that we uh, live in this world, but not of this world. I mentioned that several times. Now, in Joshua 24, an amazing passage right here. Uh, there's a verse in here that we're very familiar with where Joshua says, But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. That is wonderful, but when you look at the context, it's amazing because he gathers Israel together at Shechem for his final words to them. And then he goes back all the way to Abraham and starts recounting how God had given the land. And he rehearses all this before. And he says, The Lord's one who made us, made us multiply. He's the one that has done this. Therefore, we are to do this. We are to fear the Lord and serve Him in sincerity and truth. And he tells the nation to do that. Put away other gods. He says that over and over. Put away other gods. Put away other gods. Apparently, they kept picking up other gods as they were going along. And he says, choose for yourself whom you're going to serve. Well, the nation of Israel comes back and says, yeah, baby, we're going to do that. We're going to serve God. We're going to do it. And they say it several times. Israel agreed. This is verses 16, 17, 18. We're going to do this. But then in verses 19 through 28, something really interesting happened. Joshua looks at the people and says, you're not going to be able to do it. Remember, you serve the Lord Most High. He's a jealous God. He's a holy God. He alone is to be worshipped. He says, you're not going to be able to do it. And it's not because God had not equipped them, but he was letting them know. Whether it be because they were making this proclamation, yeah, we're going to serve him because of the uh, emotions of the moment, or because of a fleshly motivation, or just because they thought that's what he wanted to hear, or because they really thought they would be able to do it. He had to remind them, you're not going to be able to do this in the flesh. The same can be said for us. We cannot live the life of a true believer in the flesh. That's the reason the Lord tells us to die to self, to die in the flesh, to die to self constantly over and over. Israel had made a covenant right here and proclaimed. And Joshua says, hey, you've witnessed to yourself that this is what's going to happen. And then he goes and he tells them what all is going to occur. At the end of this chapter, we see that Joshua died at the age of 110 and was buried among his inheritance. Uh, two or three things we need to remember about all of this. Joshua. The Lord promised Joshua that no man would be able to stand before him all his days. And that wound up being true. He commanded Joshua to be strong and very courageous. Be strong and very courageous. Be strong and very courageous. Not to be dismayed. Not to tremble. But to meditate upon His Word. And be careful to do this day in and day out. What God told uh, Joshua in the first chapter, we see at the end of the book, that he fulfilled. It was the Lord God who fulfilled all this. At the end of the uh, 11th chapter, you see, uh, something we mentioned a couple weeks ago, the statement made that they took the whole land and had rest from war. Yes, that is true. But they did not possess all the land in perfection because they refused to walk in obedience and utterly destroying all of their enemies. We need to make sure that we destroy all the enemies within our land. Let it begin with us first. Again, I'm Dale from the Priest of Classes in Colton. It's been good to be with you as we're studying Joshua. Uh, we're going to be doing Judges next, so I'll see you again next time.